Okay, so we are continuing our survey of Old Testament. We're in the last third of Genesis. So the first section in Genesis is the primeval history, the first 11 chapters, and that is God creates the world and it talks about all the different families of the world. Then in chapter 12, we start the second section that focuses on Abraham and his descendants. And they call that the patriarchal narratives. That would be patriarch being the father. So that would be Father Abraham, Father Isaac, Father Jacob uh, stories through about chapter 36. Then we go into the Joseph narratives, the last third. And so he is a, he is a very important character a little bit of a mysterious character. So let's see what we can uh, garner from looking quickly at these chapters. Give me, a, give me a, from what you know, give me a, a general description of Joseph. What was Joseph like? As a young man. Whenever. He was his father's favorite. He, he, was, he was clearly. He knew that he could do whatever he wanted. And so he was favored, and, and for the most part, he he measures up to the favoritism, right? He has he's a good guy, but he the author wants us to know that he was a teenager that thought thought well of himself, yeah. And he antagonizes his brother, you know, the brothers. You know, as we talked about the last several weeks, it was a fractured household, and there was a lot of um, animosity between, you know, you have the sons of Leah, the four sons of Leah, five, or six sons of Leah. You have the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah, and then the two sons, Joseph and Benjamin of Rachel. Uh, and he antagonizes his brothers. And apparently Jacob is very clearly and overtly favors Joseph. And so that that's a formula for disaster, and I, I don't think we're supposed to miss that. It, even though Joseph turns out to be a pretty good guy, I think there are hints throughout the Joseph stories that Joseph wasn't perfect. He was a good guy. He was a, a sharp guy, but he wasn't perfect. Uh, what about later on? So he's kind of arrogant as a young man. He gets his brothers eventually turn on him. They, they're going to kill him. They decide to sell him into slavery. He goes to Egypt. What happens in Egypt? He becomes a, like a housekeeper, sort of. A father of him is a, a, a military man for the fair. Yeah, he is a, an important man, a Potiphar, an important man in Egypt. And Joseph becomes his house manager, basically. Um, and we'll see, we'll go through, but Joseph is successful. The name Joseph is Yosef uh, in, in Hebrew uh, from uh, um, Yosef is the verb, and that is to add. So one who adds would be a, a literal translation of his name. And that is pointing at his name is pointing out that he was an administrator. He kept the books and kept records of things uh, as he went. So looking in Genesis chapter 37, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. So the, he is in the promised land, the land that had been promised to Abraham, and Jacob had gone on to dwell there. Now he dwelt probably down in the southern part, that the, the word for south in Hebrew is Negev, and so they say in the Negev, and that's just like saying he lived in the south part of the country. Uh, and probably generally stayed clear of places like Shechem, which is kind of north central. Nor it's 40 miles north of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, probably stayed clear there because they had kind of, as we know from Genesis 34, that kind of made themselves a bad name in that country. But they probably lived well south of Jerusalem on the edge of the desert. Um, and it goes on, this is a history of Jacob. And that's a common formula in Genesis when it's going to start listing uh, things and tell us 
things about a specific family. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks with his brothers. Now, I'm, I think I've made this case with y'all before, and, I, and it was common in the ancient world where they would write things in a way to give the story a flow. So they were more worried about the narrative thread, the story flow, than they were about putting things in order. And that's disturbing to modern people because we like everything year one, year two, year three, year four in order like that. I we want, I don't know. I don't think we'll go into it a great deal, but I think this Genesis 37 actually happened. We're getting a description of what happened before Genesis 34, uh, because you'll see here uh, they're going to be messing around in the area. I, I don't I don't know how much of the scripture I have here, but they they're messing around around Shechem. And I don't think that they would be around Shechem at this point. Anyway, Joseph was feeding the flock with his brothers. So he has one brother, Benjamin. Ben is the word for son in Hebrew. Yamin is right hand. So Benjamin means son of my right hand. So he had Joseph, his favorite, and then Benjamin, son of my right hand. That's like my other favorite. So the two sons of Rachel, uh, Jacob, do doted on, the other ten brothers were treated sort of like red-headed stepchildren in this family. The la so Joseph needs to be walking lightly. He needs to understand the politics of his family and, and uh, negotiate things well. The lad Joseph was with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. So these Leah and Rachel were legitimate wives. Now it calls, the word for wife in Hebrew is woman, his father's women. Um, and it, they do call, you know, it's the same word. And so they are given status as wives, but very clearly these are the handmaids. And so as you go down the totem pole, they are at the bottom. So the most danger Joseph could be would be around Bilhah and Zilpah's sons. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. You want to sigh. You want to say, come on, Joseph. Now Israel, which is, you know, Israel means struggles with El, struggles with God. Uh, and that was the name, Jacob's name. Jacob mean, probably means something like deceiver. His name was changed from deceiver to struggle with God after he ran, wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. He was the last two born were, well, maybe not. It seems like Leah might have had a son after, a son or two after them. But anyway, they were, uh, Joseph and Benjamin were born when Jacob Israel was an old man. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Now, that is an interesting, I mean, that's the common uh, legend of the Bible. It is interesting, in the Hebrew, uh, it it does not refer to it as a coat of, of many colors. It says a coat with long sleeves, um, something like that, a long coat. Uh, and, you know, we could talk a long time, and it really does not make a huge amount of difference. The coat of many colors comes from the Greek version. When they translated the Bible into Greek, or the tradition we have, you and from our side, that comes through the Greek, the coat of many color. And the other tradition, the Hebrew tradition, does, has a long sleeve coat. Um, and we see that many times that there will be subtle variations between the Greek tradition 
and the Hebrew tradition. For example, just to give you an example of that, uh, Genesis 1, 2, and the world was void and without form, void and formless, that is a Greek um, tradition, void and formless. And you get the idea of a spiraling gases, you know, at that point in the creation. Um, but the Hebrew says it was a tohu vavohu, an uninhabitable wilderness. So very much in the Hebrew version, God created planet Earth in verse 1. And it was just in a bad shape so that mankind couldn't live there. Uh, and the, the void and formless agreed much more with the Greek way of thinking about the Earth and what was here before. Remember, Hebrew reflected the ancient world. that There was a, a big ocean here, and God brought the land up. But it just wasn't in a shape where man could live there yet. Anyway, those are just some examples. And so I don't know um, if it if he gave him a brightly colored coat or not. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that you have to, it's very complex when you try to make a decision between the Greek tradition and the, the Hebrew tradition. And in the end, it kind of doesn't matter. Clearly, he made a noteworthy garment for Joseph. A coat of many colors is more fun than a long sleeve coat, and I think that's why that has become a popular translation. But many of his brothers saw their father, but, but when Joseph's brothers saw their father loved Joseph more than any of the other brothers, they hated him and could not even speak peaceably to him. So he went and told on them, even though, you know, he should know they didn't like him. He was, he was arrogant. I mean, it, the, uh, the, the author is capturing the arrogance of really not, not just a favored son, but just your average, your average 17 year old boy is liable to have a good, a good self-image uh, and let people know it. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers so they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in a field, you know, doing the harvest, the wheat harvest. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. Indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. <laughs> you know, can, can you imagine these? These are, he's a teenager. These are all men. These, you know, probably Reuben by this point is pushing 40, if not older. You know, and this 17 year old probably, probably had the cat lick the peach fuzz off his chin still, is sitting there giving this dream, which you know, had a lot more weight then than, than we would give it now, um, that they were going to bow down to him. They didn't react well. His brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? And this is not said with a smile on their face. Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more than before. And this is deep hate. This is um, your dad doesn't love us kind of hate. Didn't love our moms. We don't get the long sleeve coats. We kind of have to fend for our own coats. They hated him even more for his dreams, more for his dreams and for his words the way he said it. Then he dreamed still another dream and he told it to his brothers. Look, I have dreamed another dream. This time, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down to me. He's getting cosmic here in the scope of things. So he told his father and his brothers and his father, even Jacob was like, that's uncool. His father rebuked him, saying, What is this dream that you've dreamed? 
Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to earth to, before you? So again, I'll say, uh, Joseph was full of himself, and the author wants us to know that that Joseph isn't perfect. Perfect. There are there are issues, and there there are more as you go through it. I don't think we'll see some of them. You know, later he puts a cup in. He's <clears throat> once his brothers come to Egypt to to ask for things, he deceives them. He keeps his identity secret, so he's got some of that deceitfulness of Jacob. Um, and he puts a cup in one of their bags and sends them on and then goes and captures them and says, oh, you stole a cup. Well, that cup is a divining cup, so he's practicing witchcraft. Um, so so he is a good guy, but there are problems. And, and we'll, I think we'll get a little bit later into why I think that is. Um, I think that's some Hebrew honesty. Um, and I think they're trying to represent some things, too. Uh, anyway, verse 11, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So it troubled Israel, Jacob Israel, and he thought a lot about it. So, so let's begin to, so that kind of sets up young Joseph. Let's look briefly through his life after that. So he is, so they capture him, they're gonna kill him, and it is Reuben the oldest, and Judah, who the line of descendancy will go through Judah, who step in to defend Joseph and keep him from being killed by his brother, mainly Reuben. Uh, and so he, instead they sell him into slavery, and he goes into Potiphar's house. Potiphar is the captain of the guard, a military general, wealthy man. And Joseph uh, can't, eventually is so trustworthy that he manages Potiphar's whole estate, tells the servants, other servants what to do, pays the bills, uh, makes sure the cooks have the meals prepared, everything. He's the, he's the boss of the household. Well, it says he's a very handsome young man, and Potiphar's wife gets after him. You know the story. She she says, go and sleep with me, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. She grabs his robe, and he takes the, or grabs his coat, and he takes the coat off and runs out of the house to get away from her, and she says, look, I have his coat. He was trying to rape me, so they throw him into prison. Uh, well, he eventually rose up and came to manage the prison the same way, administrator. Uh, he says, we need this, we need this, we need this, you know, and he, he tells people where they're supposed to stay and he just organizes everything so that the chief jailer is thrilled with him. Now, there is the, meanwhile, the, the Pharaoh's baker and cup bearer are thrown in prison. And both these are very important positions because um, kings are often poisoned. And so the baker has to be very trusted because the king will be eating the bread. And the cup bearer is the one who drinks when it, before he gives wine to the pharaoh, he takes a drink to show that it's not poisoned. And so these were very trusted men and they had done something that had made Pharaoh mad and he had thrown them in jail. Um, and so anyway, they tell, they each have dreams and they tell Joseph their dream and he interprets them. Now it's very important. Uh, the Bible does not call Joseph a prophet. So Joseph is not getting visions. It calls him instead a wise man. Uh, that is, he is using good sense to interpret these dreams. And his interpretations are correct. And so the Bible is saying the dreams were sent by God and they are true, but Joseph does not have prophetic power where he's getting visions. He is a wise man. And, and I'm, I want to make an important point for that. One of the things Joseph is called 
and it's a literary term, he's called a type, T-Y-P-E, for Jesus. That means a lot of his characteristics forecast characteristics in Jesus later. Um, and one of those is the fact that Jesus is not called a prophet. Jesus is called a wise man. Um, and, and that's an important thing. Jesus did not know the future always. Um, anyway, so the baker, he interprets the baker's dream, you're going to get hung, and he does, but, but he interprets the cupbearer, you're going to come into favor with Pharaoh, and he does, and he goes back into Pharaoh's service, the cupbearer, and Pharaoh has a dream. He says, somebody interpret, and the, the cupbearer had forgotten about Joseph. He goes, oh yeah, I know a guy when I was in jail that was great at interpreting visions. So Pharaoh said, bring him in. Bring him in. See if he can interpret my dream. And he does. He is able to forecast a famine coming. And he is so trustworthy, he has made the regent or manager of all of the land of Egypt at about age 30. Uh, and by interpreting the dreams, Joseph immediately, when he gets put in charge, begins uh, buying as much grain as he could and storing it. So when the famine hits, this awful famine, Egypt has lots of grain because of Joseph planning ahead. Um, meanwhile, back up in Canaan, there is, the famine has affected people. They can't get food up there. They hear that there's food in Egypt. Jacob, Israel, sends his sons down to buy food in Egypt. And who do they go to? Unbeknownst to them, they go to Joseph, who they sold into slavery. And then they, they took the coat of many colors, dipped it in blood, and took it back to Jacob and said, a lion got Joseph and killed him. So that's all, you know, a big part of, of the Old Testament is understanding, um, you know, they are telling stories. And so this story is, is getting uh, uh, complex in its uh, uh, different aspects. So Joseph hides his identity from his brothers. When they come, his brothers bow down to him and beg him to sell them grain and save their family. He begins to give them... Uh, quizzes. And so Joseph begins playing games with them, testing them. Uh, kind of, he, he sets, he lays traps for them. Like I said, he, he does a thing where he puts a cup, his divining cup. So, so they would put water in the divining cup and they would stir it and they would watch the way that it swirled and they would make predictions by this. And so that's an odd little detail that they would put in there um, that, that Joseph had a divining cup. Just again, a little hint that Joseph is not purpose, perfect. Anyway, he tests them. And one of the things he does is he puts that cup in Benjamin's sack because Benjamin is his full brother. Same mama, same daddy. And then he takes Benjamin prisoner he sends guys after him, says, somebody has stole the, our master's cup, and it's in Benjamin's sack. Well, it is Judah. Again, another little hint that there's something unique about Judah. Judah intercedes for Benjamin. What does he say? Take me. He, he is willing to sacrifice himself for Benjamin. He said, take me prisoner, send Benjamin back. That's a substitution uh, and that is a foreshadowing again one day the descendant of Judah in the messianic line will sacrifice himself and substitute himself for all mankind and so we see a hint all the way back in the opening book of the of the Bible in Genesis a little bit later after playing lots of games Joseph reveals himself and saves all of Israel. And so without Joseph, we we are led to believe that, that Israel, the sons of Israel, would have died in the famine. And so Joseph is 
a savior for his people. Ironically, very ironic because he saves the brothers who, who tried to kill him. Again, uh, lots of themes in this that, that run throughout, run all the way to the cross. Here is the intercession of Judah. Judah talking to Joseph, he says, your servant became surety for the lad, Benjamin, to my father. So in order to, so originally Jacob would not let Benjamin go with him to buy grain. And Joseph manipulated him. He said, I don't believe you that you have another brother named Benjamin. If you don't bring Benjamin, I'm not going to sell you any grain. So, so they told Jacob that they had to take Benjamin. He said, no, no, no. Well, Judah said, if, if I don't bring Benjamin back, you know, you can have my life. Uh, and so your servant Judah became surety for the lad to my father, talking to Joseph. If I do not bring Benjamin back to you, talking to Jacob, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please, Joseph, though he doesn't know it's Joseph, let your servant Judah remain here in Egypt instead of Benjamin as a slave to my Lord Joseph. Let the lad go up with his brothers back up to Israel, back up to Canaan. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. It's going to crush him. He may die from it. So that is Judah's intercession. And so you see how all these little threads and all these little clues are woven in. Um, it is a, it's a fascinating story. It is a fun story. Um, but it's got all kind of little hints of things to come in it. Okay, we said Joseph reveals himself, saves Israel. Now, without going into each verse, can y'all think of a time that God speaks to Joseph in the stories? And I'm, I'm asking this for specific reasons to bring out something. But can anybody think of a time where God had a conversation with Joseph? Well, I'm, I'm taking that as a no. And the reason is because there's not a time. After, once God starts talking in chapter 12 to Abraham, God talks to the patriarchs. And the, the, the term in Hebrew is Vayumer Elohim. And God said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and just there's lots of God talking. And so all of a sudden we get to Joseph, and Joseph is a good guy. He saves Israel. Every job, everything he does, he's got the Midas touch for administration. Everything he touches turns to gold. And that's certainly, you know, he's certainly the story promotes him. Why does God not talk to Joseph. Got any ideas? Isn't that strange? Have, have you ever thought about that before? I mean, God's been talking his head off to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it seems that Joseph's a good guy. I mean, really, by and large, I mean, I've pointed out a couple of little hints, but by and large, Joseph is a better character than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, Jacob, uh, 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 Joseph had an opportunity to go sleep with Potiphar's wife. He refused it. Abraham went off with Hagar. Um, Isaac, there's not a story of Isaac having a second wife, but we know Jacob. Jacob ran off with any little handmaid that come his way. Why is God not talking to him? to Joseph. Seems odd, doesn't it? 
Well, let me tell you what I think. I think as we go through the list um, of people and the stories of people, I think Joseph is the model for how we are to relate to God. And it says that Joseph is a wise man. He takes what's given to him and he does his best. And he, he, we would call him excellent. He always is doing the best he can in any situation. Doesn't matter who he's serving, he's giving his best effort. Um, and he is a generally moral person. And he doesn't have to ask God, should I go down to Egypt or should I go blah, blah, blah. He makes wise choices. My thinking is that it is intentional. Notice that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is talking to them, and they still, by the time you get to Jacob, he does whatever he wants anyway, even with God talking to him. God does not want us to be, God should I, you know, we are to lean on God kind of as an umbrella concept for our life. But I don't think we're supposed to ask God, say, okay, God, I'm hungry. Should I eat? You know what I'm saying? God would say, I made you hungry. You know, when you're hungry, eat. Well, God, should I go use the bathroom? God's like, don't bother me. <laughs> it's that. Go live your life. And that's why God doesn't prescribe to us exactly what job we should have god says go and find you know go live your life and find what and everything within reason because we are to depend on god we are to ask god for help and then we're to go and find our way in life um and i think that that he is showing there is to be a balance between a reliance on god and expecting god to tell us, dictate everything we do. We are supposed to be thinking uh, people who, who, who want to please God in the way we live our life. And I, and I think that's an intentional thing. And that's the implication. I think, I think he wants us to pray and be wise and live lives that honor him. Uh, what function does Joseph play in the big scheme of things? And this $64,000 question in and again, I have a theory. I've shared that a little bit. Uh, but he may want to tell what, what purpose, because it is very fascinating to me that Joseph is good, and Joseph saves Israel, and Joseph doesn't need God's dictation to make wise choices. Uh, and yet, the Messiah walks right past Joseph. The Messiah is not in Joseph's line. The ultimate savior, the one that will defeat the serpent, is not in Joseph's line. And in the end, Joseph's, the two tribes that descend from Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, end up being pretty wicked tribes. Um, but at this point in the story, what function does he serve? You may want to take a stab, and I've I've talked about it somewhat. I think. Well, I think that Joseph represents Israel, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, and I think his intention is for the Hebrew people to be good and moral and wise people that live lives that honor him, because. And they must survive because they are the um, the Messiah people, the people that will give birth to the Messiah. Now, the Messiah is going to to make salvation possible for everybody. He's going to bring about the Messiah will bring about God's kingdom on earth, and so. Those little hints about Joseph that aren't so great, I think are hints about the Hebrew people. Um, there's a little chip they have on their shoulder, or a little arrogance maybe that they have being God's chosen people. And I think the some of the deception, manipulation 
Maybe the biblical author is attributing some characteristics. Uh, I think the divination cup shows that they dabble in things that they should not, as all people do. And so he's far from perfect, but I do think he it represents uh, Israel, Hebrew, the Hebrew people. But very importantly, he is not the Messiah. And Judah, who is not all that great a person, will bear is the seed bearer for the Messiah. And so it's important that you differentiate the two. Judah, the tribe of Judah will survive until Jesus is born. Uh, Joseph, representing he, the Hebrew people, the whole nation of Israel, um, most of them will not make it to the time of the Messiah. They'll be taken away. Now explain this verse. So once the brothers learn that Joseph is the brother that they put in the pit, they said, please don't kill us. Joseph's response was, talking to those brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me. You were going to kill me. Reuben and Judah stepped in. You didn't kill me, but you were trying to send me away to suffer as a slave all my life. But God, who directs reality, who guides the steps, whether we want him to or not, guides our steps, everything that happens, um, God meant it for good. And this is a great statement of God's sovereignty over things. It was interesting that the skinhead that, that came to heart life today um, was quoted a scripture in Isaiah 45 and you know he was he, he was in a bad state. And he, and he quoted Isaiah 45 5 and 6 and I'll have to go look and see what what version he, but anyway, in the verse it said, God created all things uh, good and evil. You know, he's like, what's that, God creating evil? And my response was, well, I mean, I, to me it's irresistible. Everything, nothing happens outside of God's will. And so if you want to say that, uh, I think, I think the, the Bible will withstand the weight of that. God, you know, James says God did not cause evil, but certainly I would say, and that's true, God allows evil. That is part of his plan. Uh, but, and so God allowed the brothers to do evil against Joseph. And the brothers could never know without being told that actually God meant for Joseph to go to Egypt in order to save them. So by doing an evil thing, God's sovereignty was saving their lives. That's mind blowing, isn't it? <laughs> no wonder people people go argue back and forth about predestination and all those things. Um, I will just make a brief statement right here and you, you, you know this is what I think. I think you know this, but nothing happens outside of God's will. Nothing happens that God has not foreordained. At the same time, he does that in a way that, that we have the freedom of choice to choose God or reject God. He allows us to make that decision. Now that... That is contradictory to people, and there are people that that makes so mad. That's one of the most con more controversial things, uh, subjects that people have related to religion. But I think it's irresistible because faith is not faith without a choice, without a person having the ability to make choice. Uh, belief is not belief if you don't have a choice. At the same time, God is in control. This world is not spinning. And we can't know. We can't know. Um, we can't know what is 
how our actions affect and that's why we try our best to do God's will we make wise choices minute to minute we're making choices and we're trying to make choices that are pleasing to God as best we can and when we fail and inevitably all of us fail then we get back up we dust ourselves off and we try to make the next choice one that is pleasing to God and and when we do something intentionally willfully that pushes God aside we we own it and we say we're sorry and we keep moving forward but he said God meant this thing for good in order to bring it about as it is this day it was God's will for us to have this Bible study it was God's will for us to be here together to save many people alive and you know people can are going to do what they're going to do but God's intention is to save as many people as possible and it's why he inspired the Bible as he did it's why he has allowed the earth to take the course and it sometimes is bad um, sometimes there is local evil that happens because of the way the universe is spinning it doesn't really matter it's it's supposed to not matter I mean if we're not supposed to like it when bad things happen but we are supposed to seek God as our portion God who doesn't change have faith in him and get up dust yourself off face the next choice and try to make a choice that is pleasing to God and I think that by the first book of the Bible there's 66 books in the Bible by the end of the first one we have a well-developed idea of who God is and justice and that we are to live as faithful people that is the book of Genesis any questions we will roll next week into the book of Exodus, and then we'll keep going from there. In Exodus, we'll go through Exodus quite a bit quicker than we got through Genesis, believe it or not. Any questions or comments? Okay, let's be dismissed.